joined by Ryan Brodinger. Brian, thank you for your, your patience and waiting for us as well at the College Baseball World Series. A&M thumped Texas yesterday 10-2. to Hey, I was asked by Brian Etheridge if you took or you took your or brought your Mophie this time. My, I brought my what? Your Mophie. Is there some sort of a... It's a, a phone charger. Yeah. Th- th- oh. A, yeah. That, that, I didn't know what that meant, but he asked me to ask you that question if you brought your yeah. Mophie this time. Yeah, Etheridge has got jokes, but you know what? When Etheridge shows up to all these recruiting events, he's always the most prepared guy there. So I'll give him that. You know, we can't give Brian too many, too many compliments, but when he does show up, he is prepared. So uh, yesterday, A and M was obviously prepared. Texas got a couple of runs early, but it didn't seem like they bl- they they were able to blink. How important was that? Obviously, besides the tournament, to get that win against Texas, it's the first time in the College World Series. Yeah, I think more so than winning against Texas. Uh, you know, that's the first win a and had in the College World Series since 1993. Uh, and it's the reason why you hired Jim Schlossnagel, right? And it's mm-hmm. the reason why you ripped him away from TCU was to get to Omaha more and to win games in Omaha. Now, to do so, uh, winning your first game since 1993, and in doing so, you send the Longhorns back to Austin. I mean, that's just the biggest cherry on top of the cake for Aggies that you could – possibly imagine and so uh you know it it was really interesting david and listening to the kids come out of the tunnel yesterday uh after the win they were you know leaving the dugout and coming up into the tunnel into the media area and there wasn't a lot of them talking about what they just did uh, there was a lot of them talking about what they could do and so i think that's kind of the mentality of this team you know they went into the game as uh obviously you know you get to amp up a little bit more to play texas but they came into the game with just you know winning that winning the day and then progressing in the tournament, you know, next man up kind of next game uh, mentality. And uh, that, that was really interesting to me. You know, you figure they'd come off the field and be real loud and rambunctious about beating Texas in Omaha, but it was very businesslike and in, in just kind of interacting with the players and seeing how they were interacting with each other. Ryan, they were probably the hottest team as far as momentum going into the, into the postseason and the college world series is as what they've done in the last couple of, of weeks. What is that when Jim Schloss Nagel, I mean, only in this his first year at AM, when his kind of attitude and everything kind of took hold and they, they were able to kind of roll with that, uh, you know, late in the season on in. Well, it really started, if you go back and look how the season went, and I was I was at Olsen Field at Bluebell Park uh, in a, on a Tuesday night in March against the University of Houston where A&M lost 8-2, to two, and the team and the program, it just looked dead in the water. It looked stale, and then we're sitting there going, we're talking on Tech Zags about, you know, the patience that's going to be needed for this rebuild and, you know, how much work Jim Schlossnagel's got to do to get this program back to the level that he had it at TCU, and they go on the road the next week to LSU to open up conference play, and it's like the whole season changed between College Station and Baton Rouge. The mentality of the hitters changed, the mentality of the offense. Um, the, the team found their identity in Baton Rouge, uh, so they take two out of three from LSU there in, uh, uh, in Louisiana, and then they come on the road the next week uh, in a midweek at Texas, and they beat Texas 12-8. to eight. And from then on, guys, like, th- this A&M team has been completely different since th- those that stretch of games right there. And I-, I don't know what it was, if it was like, you know, maybe the us-against-the-world mentality uh, that they had in the dugout in, in Baton Rouge or-, or what it was. But they came together, they found their identity, and it all started to click. When you have all these new coaches and all these kids from all over the country transferring in, you know, maybe we, as analysts, maybe we were the ones that were too impatient. Then we should have seen, you know, it was just going to take time for this thing to gel and click. And then when it did, and credit to the kids, that they, they grabbed hold of that identity and they haven't let it go. What was that atmosphere like? Which one? Uh, for the Texas game. Oh, in the game. stadium. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, so we're kind of up in the press box, you know, and you got to be buttoned up. And uh, it's a crowded press box in Omaha, but – um, just from the stories that, that we've heard from in the stands, that it, it was pretty rowdy. And I think you saw some of the clips, um, some interactions between fans and fans and players. And, um, you know, it, it may be seven, 800 miles from College Station in Austin for Omaha, but it felt like, you know, we were somewhere on Highway 21 playing that game. You know, it, it, it's just it, – how – 
How fantastic is it with all this going on with the future of the SEC that they end up playing in the College World Series? Well, I guess the future of the SEC and it being fantastic that Texas is coming in is going to depend on who you ask, right? I think there are a lot of people wearing maroon that don't think that it's too fantastic. And there's probably a lot of folks wearing green and gold in Waco that think it is fantastic because they're finally getting away from them. And I heard what y'all were talking about with the horns down and stuff. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, if it was inevitable and it was going to happen, then you might as well rip the Band-Aid off and let it happen. But, um, you know, I, I think a lot of a and fans would tell you that they're not real pumped about being in the same conference with those guys again. Well, I mean, that's the, like, you know, you could say every which reason why they left, but that's why they left. I mean, being in the SEC, money and prestige and all that stuff, but it was also money and prestige without having to uh, seemingly run everything by Austin, Texas. And now, uh, while it, it works differently in the SEC, you know, you break up with someone, you don't expect them to move next door. <laughs> that's a pretty good analogy. And I, I think the big thing is, was it just caught a lot of Aggies off guard, right? And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, that, that felt like something that uh, A&M would get a heads up on before it happened. And it, you know, it just kind of, you know, was sprung upon uh, the A&M fan base there all at once. But, you know, you live and you learn and you adapt. And I think, you know, Texas and uh, is going to have to learn how to function in the SEC. And, no disrespect to the Big 12, and especially what you guys have done there at Baylor. It's been pretty remarkable across uh, a lot of sports, what you guys have done. But, uh, you know, in the SEC, it's it's the week-in, week-out grind that's the biggest difference, right? Like the depth of the conference. And, you know, it's, it's not about going and playing a three-game series against Arkansas and winning it. It's that you got to turn around the next week and then you got Florida coming to your place. Then you got to go to South Carolina or Ole Miss. And so it's just – the depth of the league, it does allow you to take weekends off. And it, it's that's why I think, guys, the most impressive thing this a and baseball team may have done this year is win the SEC West. When you look at the totality of the season and how hard that is to do, uh, and, and then they, you know, they only won nine games in the conference in 2021, that kind of turnaround to win the best division in college baseball, that was probably their, their biggest accomplishment so far. You think about the emotions that they've been through in the postseason, playing TCU in the uh, regional – and then playing mm-hmm. UT in uh, at the College World Series, to me, I mean, it, it says quite a bit about this team. Well, they I actually wrote a column today, David, about, well, this team has done nothing but kick doors down all year. And, uh, you know, they busted through quite a big one yesterday and, and did so by, by beating your arch rival and sending them home from the College World Series where, you know, you kind of had a little, not a curse, but you, you I mean, you lost eight in a row. In, in Omaha, and uh, you know they getting the TCU monkey off their back. There was no TCU curse. TCU had um, a, a coach sitting in the dugout. That was the difference in those series in fifteen, sixteen, and whenever TCU sent A&M home from Omaha in seventeen. The biggest difference in those games was that Jim Schlossnagel was wearing purple and purple and black, and now he's wearing maroon and white. So, yeah, this this team is they'll be long remembered uh, in Aggie lore for. A lot of things, uh, but you know, putting putting the stamp on it yesterday against the Longhorns. I mean, that just that has endeared them to the Aggie fan base forever. So, what do you think about uh, what's potentially next uh, with uh, Oklahoma and and Notre Dame or and or Notre Dame? Yeah, so they'll get Notre Dame tomorrow at one. Uh, and look, man, this, I think it's a coin flip. I think every team here can can still win this thing. Uh, Oklahoma looks like the hottest team here. Uh, they're going to be really tough to beat, not not just once, but somebody's got to, to beat them twice. But for A and M, uh, they're got to, to get. I mean, they got a great start out of Micah Dallas against Texas. That's something that is pretty remarkable that they've won all these games and the starting pitching has been. I mean, inconsistent would be a compliment to to give this this starting pitching so far. So, if they can get a repeat performance uh, on the mound out of whoever they're going to start, they haven't announced that yet. Um, then then this A and M offense who scored you know, eight runs and now 10 runs, 18 runs in two games in Omaha. And they've done that without Dylan Rock, their best player, uh, or their most productive offensive player, getting any hits. Um, so you got to like that we're a and offense at in terms of run production. So if they can get some quality start, uh, some quality starting pitching, uh, and, and limit the free base runners, that has absolutely killed them so far in Omaha. Mm-hmm. They're putting themselves in some really tight positions on, on defense just because they walk guys or – they don't field a bunt or they kick a ground ball, uh, you know, against Oklahoma, 
Jim Schlossnagel had 19 total free bases. I mean, 19 times the Aggies told the Sooners, you can get to, you get to go to first base without doing anything. When you do that at this level, you're going to lose the baseball game. So they got to limit that and they got to keep the offense kind of how it's been all year. How about the relief pitching? Uh, and and I, I, correct me on how to say his name. Is it Palish, the, the relief pitcher? That the came, Polish. Polish. Polish uh, he, yeah. and the moment with uh, 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 with uh, the star from Texas, I'm, I'm Melendez, I mean, mm -hmm. he was nuts and bolts in that game for Texas A&M. Yeah, he's been that all year. And he has had some incredibly gutsy outings for the Aggies throughout their SEC slate. You know, he's a Dallas-Fort Worth kid, as out of Richardson, but went to Stanford – uh, wanted to come back home to his home state and finish his college career, and he has been he's been by far A&M's best arm out of the bullpen uh, from start to finish. And they've had uh, some kids step up, Mu Minifee, uh, Brad Rudis, uh, Chris Cortez, Will Johnson. These are all kids that have really come on, and the bullpen has actually been pretty stinking good for the Aggies uh, for the majority of the postseason. So it's about finding uh, the hot hand in the starting rotation, uh, they seem to have gotten that out of Micah Dallas. But what we saw to Jacob Polish yesterday is, is what we've seen him do for the entirety of the year for the Aggies. And uh, to make those quality pitches, not only the Melendez, and everybody will remember the Melendez strikeout because really, guys, I thought, that, I thought Texas quit competing after that strikeout. Mm -hmm. I thought the game was over after that strikeout happened. Um, but Polish made a, a really good pitch to strike out uh, the Longhorn leadoff hitter Douglas Hodo, two hitters mm -hmm. before. Um, on a two-strike pitch, and he threw a fastball in and froze Hodo uh, with two men on. So, I mean, he was making quality pitches. I think he had five punch-outs in two and two-thirds innings um, and was getting a lot of, of kind of easy routine contact whenever he was getting contact. It, it, was, uh, it, it was a remarkable performance by him. It's something we've seen him do all year. Ryan, have you been to this Rocco's Bar in uh, Omaha to, to do the Jello Shot Challenge, which I'm seeing all over Twitter? <laughs> no, we haven't. We were at a place uh, called Lefty's, which was right next to it, where you can actually order pizza from Rocco's and have it delivered to Lefty's. But we have not been in there. Um, they're charging $4.50 for those things, which um, I don't know how long it's been since either of you guys have had a Jello shot, but I don't think they cost $4.50 <laughs> to make. No. You can buy 12 <laughs> boxes of Jello yeah. for $4.50. Yeah. Yeah. Man. So. so, and then I saw apparently an Arkansas fan who's not even in Omaha sent $2,200 to the bar to buy Jello shots just for Arkansas fans. Wow. I mean, we got to think of a better way. We got inflation, we got all kinds of stuff going on in the economy. And we're going to spend twenty two hundred bucks on four dollars and fifty cent Jello shot. Yeah, we can build spend your money how you man. want to, I guess. You know? Yeah, yeah. Call, we got schools and hospitals, and I mean everybody. Yeah, but we got Jello shots. All call, right, yeah. call yeah. the hogs, baby. <laughs> I, I'll just tell you, uh, Ryan. I personally, I'm forty two years old, and if I took a Jello shot, uh, there's nothing but judgment internally and externally. Yes, uh, on. <laughs> Yeah. On anybody seeing me do it. Yeah. Oh well, I'm glad you explained <laughs> right. that because I saw that total and it was like 600. And I was like, there's no way. So, yeah, somebody's sending $2,200. That makes sense how that, that, that total got so high for the, the Razorbacks. But it, it sounds like a lot of headaches to me. Oh, oh man. Oh, my God. Yeah. Thanks for your time, Ryan. Uh, tomorrow, 1 o'clock, it's uh, uh, Texas A&M and Notre Dame, the elimination game. The winner will get Oklahoma. have to beat them twice. Thanks for your time. Have fun in my uh, where I was born in Omaha. Enjoy the week.